Hi everyone, welcome back to Playdate. We took a pause last week due to Blackout Tuesday and the show must be paused. We're back this week with Kate and Bianca, which is a new play by Marcia Johnson. Uh, on Playdate, we've been very fortunate to aid the development of this play by a black woman about black and indigenous characters at this time. Uh, stay tuned after the reading for a Q&A with the playwright. You can post your questions in the comments below. Let's meet our readers. Hi there, my name is Alexis Gordon and I'll be reading Bianca today. Hi, my name is Beverly Njoku and I'll be reading Kate. Hello, my name is Eric Ray. I'll be reading Peter and Christopher Sly. Oh, my name is Darla Conqua and I'll be reading Guide and Naomi. I'm Keely Eyre. I will be uh, reading Stage Directions and as the supervisor. I'm Catherine Reeford, and I will be playing Aoife. Hi, right, it's Ray Strawn, and I'm playing Batista. All right. Uh, Kate and Bianca by Marcia Johnson. Induction, 21st century, a historic 19th century home in Toronto. Christopher Sly is in the sitting room. It's been cordoned off with a velvet rope, but one section of the rope and stanchion has been knocked over. Christopher is playing the harpsichord, though it's obvious that he's never had a lesson in his life. He's enjoying himself immensely. He's also quite drunk. Guide enters. Both she and Christopher are in 19th century dress. He's in the sitting room. Over. From Walkie Talkie. Okay, be there soon. Over. Guide clips the walkie-talkie out of sight onto a belt. Any requests? Sir, you're in a restricted area. Ma'am, I have access to the entire house. Could you please stop? Not a fan of the classics, eh? What about jazz? He starts attacking the keys more spiritedly. Stop, or I'll have you arrested. Officer, the man who won a night stay in Edworth House is actually using the house. Something tells me that you're used to talking to the police. He stops playing. Clearly, you don't know who I am. Christopher Sly, according to the reservation. I'll have you know that my great, 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 great uh, grandfather, Burton Sly, came in with John Graves Simcoe in 1791. Hmm, as far back as that? He helped build this province. You must be very proud. Damn straight. Another ale, please, wench. Only after you pay for the glasses that you broke in the fireplace. Don't call me wench. I was being historically accurate in both cases. He starts to leave the room. He stumbles. Guide helps him to get ready on his feet, steady on his feet. He ends up turning around, facing the room again. He walks back in, thinking that it's a different room. Hmm, must have been a sale on this carpeting. Guide takes out the walkie-talkie. Where are you? From walkie-talkie. Almost there. Over. Sorry. Over. The actors will be here any minute. We'll figure something out. Over. Hope so. Over. By now, Sly has curled up on the floor. Sir, get up, please. I could have been the master of this house back when Canada was great. I don't get paid enough for this. Actors playing Batista, Eva, Kate, and Bianca enter. Where are they supposed to be? The Manola family. Come on. I thought you... You were, you were going to be historically accurate. We are. You're telling me that a black man, no offense, uh, lived in a house like this in the... What year are we supposed to be in? 1854. Yes. You think he existed back in 1854? He is an amalgamation of several wealthy black men. What revisionist crap. Please take your seat with the rest of the audience, Mr. Sly. She starts putting the velvet rope and stanchions away. The bar had better been open at intermission. He exits, grudgingly. 
Sorry, guys. She leaves as the actors get into position. Act one, scene one, Toronto, 1854. The Manola home sitting room. Kate and Baptista are in mid argument. Aoife is putting the finishing touches on a flower arrangement. I may as well be a prostitute. Katerina, what would you call it, mother? There's no talking to her when she gets like this. Who's she, the cat's mother? Kate, hey, you're not being fair. Father's offering money, not soliciting. Her. You stay out of this, Miss Perfect. Do not take this out on your sister. Why does she get everything that she wants? I do not. You get to choose your husband. I gave you two choices. Meth Methuselah and Abraham. George and Howard are good men. What if I choose not to marry at all? Not marry? Eva, talk some sense into your daughter. I'm your daughter too. Eh, don't remind me. Baptista. You don't care about me at all. That's not true, darling. Why didn't he say that? Who's he? The cats? The neighbors will hear us. Let them. My father wants to pay a total stranger to marry me. Sweetheart, calm down. Why can you not be more like your sister? Father, must you pit them against each other, Baptista? Go to your room, Bianca. Why? Because you are a delicate flower. Oh, I am not. My dear, being delicate is something for which a lady should be proud. I'm an ogre then, a big black ogre. This again. Both of my daughters are beautiful. I will hear no more of this. Don't cry, mother. Now look what you've done. My own father thinks I'm an ogre. I did not say that. You say it every time you look at me. Be quiet. Please. Bianca is now sitting with a tearful Aoife. Kate and Baptista avoid eye contact. Would you like me to play, mother? In a moment, dear. Aoife gestures to Kate for her to join them. Kate considers this. Can you at least meet with one of the gentlemen? The moment is ruined. Never. Play something quickly. Bianca sits at the harpsichord and begins to play. Oh, lovely. Baptista sits with Aoife. They watch Bianca play. Again, Aoife gestures for Kate to join her. Kate considers it again. Then she observes Baptista looking at Bianca lovingly as she plays. Beautiful, my dear. Oh, to be so fair of face that one never has to achieve anything of real significance. Baptista, uh, Bianca stops playing and rises. Good night, mother. Father, sister. Bianca leaves the room. Do I need to tell you what you must do? But, no mother, I'll go. Kate starts to leave. You were always disobedient, Katharina. Shouldn't have said that. Kate removes the flowers from the vase, throws them to the floor, and stamps on them before leaving. That could not have gone worse. You caught her by surprise. Well, that would not justify her behavior. The two of you are so much alike. Uh, by alike, you mean we both see ourselves as the head of this household, then I agree with you. I wonder why you don't hold Bianca responsible for any of this. Why would I? She announced her engagement without getting your permission. Oh, now, that was a surprise. You really didn't notice that she and Luke were falling in love? You're telling me that you did? They kept getting closer and closer to each other on the piano bench. Well, I wasn't home for that. I wish that you could spend more time at home. Darling, I'm being pulled in so many directions. Please, Baptista, if you could be here for every night for dinner, it would make such a difference. All right, my dear, I will try. That will be wonderful. She puts her head on his shoulder. A moment. Bianca is so very young. <laughs> We were only a few years older at our wedding. Mm, the best day of my life. We got to choose each other, if you recall. You disagree with me then? I wish you would have conferred with me before parading her in front of those old widowers. They were paying a friendly visit. 
within five minutes of each other, flowers in hand. One would think that she would be flattered. Oh, Baptista. What? Did you advertise for her? No, I just got to talking about Kate at the tavern, but advertise, that's not a bad idea. It's a horrible idea. But we cannot allow Bianca to marry before her older sister. You of all people? Are you worried about appearances? I am a city councilor now, Aoife. A poor excuse to lose both our daughters in the same year. We would be gaining son-in-laws. The dowry will attract men who are only interested in the money. When it comes to Kate, there needs to be a, a sweetening of the pot. Why? Well, you see how differently people treat Kate than Bianca? Those are people whose opinion I don't care for. You should care. Kate's chances of attracting a white husband are... Why does he have to be white? Well, you would want your daughter to marry some farmhand or runaway slave? If our daughter loved him, I wouldn't care a jot about his background. Well, you say that now. I mean it. Plus, who's to say she wouldn't find another wealthy black man? It, it's not just the money. It's status. Are you really saying what I think you're saying? He sits at a desk and takes a sheet of paper from a drawer. Uh, just enough time before the newspaper office closes. Baptista, do not do this. Someone's going to slip on those flowers. End of conversation? End of conversation. He writes. One would think the only reason you married me was for the color of my skin. Aoife. I'll see to the mess. Aoife leaves. Baptista composes the ad. Scene two. An undisclosed area. Wanted. A white man of noble character from marriage to a half-black woman, 22 years of age. Dowry of $10,000. Please apply to Batista Minola at the address listed below. Peter, a scruffy-looking young man, comes into view. He sits at a table drinking beer and reading what appears to be the ad in the newspaper. It makes his day. Scene three, Bianca's room. She is sewing ribbon to a bonnet. Kate is waiting in the doorway. Mother sent you? I would have come eventually. <laughs> when? Next month? I shouldn't have taken it out on you. Especially since I am on your side. I know. So why must you lash out at me? I get so angry. The words come out before I know what has happened. You hurl them with such perfect aim right into my heart. Can we jump to you forgiving me, please? I always do. Kate hugs her. Yanka tries to keep the needle away. Oh, careful. They hug for a moment. Show me. Oh, it's not finished. Yanka puts on the bonnet. Beautiful. Mm. Try it on. It would look dreadful. I would look de dreadful in it. Bianca insists. She removes the needle and puts the bonnet on Kate's head. Kate was right. It's much more suited to Bianca's coloring. See? She takes it off. You are beautiful, Kate. Not everyone thinks so, including father. Father does think you're beautiful. Kate gives her a look. He feels bad, but never mind. He wishes that I were light-skinned like you. He wishes it didn't matter as much to people. I should elope with the blackest man I could find. That would teach him. Would you? Really, Kate? If I loved him the way that you love Luke. Sorry to hold up your wedding. Well, Luke has to finish his studies anyway. I think that mother is trying to convince father to let you get married before me. Would that bother you? It would be sheer folly to wait for me to get married. Don't say that. I am so tired. It will all work out. How can you be so sure? I just am. Liar. Hmm, you sound just like father. <laughs> but he is fortright and unflinching, and I, on the other hand, am sharp-tongued and cursed. It's not fair. No, it isn't. Do you mind if I stay here for a while? As long as you'd like. 
I'm so tired. Kate curls up on Bianca's bed and seems to fall asleep immediately. Everything will be fine. But Bianca doesn't look so sure as she resumes her sewing. Scene four, the Manola sitting room. Baptista and Peter, who has cleaned up nicely, are having a jovial conversation over whiskey. Halfway through the creek, and I felt the saddle slipping off. No. And before I knew it, Splash, right in the drink. Did the horse drag you in? Fortunately, Sultana was thirsty. I was able to disentangle myself while she had a drink. Does this sort of thing happen often? I've been thrown, kicked in the ribs. Comes with the territory. Oh, your wife must worry. I am a bachelor. You don't say. It's hard to put down roots in the horse trading business. Yeah, maybe it's time to find another line of work. The thought did cross my mind in that river. Well, you are young enough to start all over again and meet the right young lady. Another drink? Baptista is already refilling Peter's glass. Business must be good if you can afford to ply your customers with high quality whiskey. <laughs> Not all my customers get this treatment, I'll have you know. What's so special about me? Well, you're that rare breed. An American who treats me with respect as his equal. I am really quite ashamed of my countrymen in the South. Well, things are not exactly perfect here, but at least slavery is no more. When did that happen? Well, Twenty years ago, August 1st. Were you... Uh, I hope you don't mind my asking. Uh, no, I wasn't a slave. My father was a free man. I'm glad for you. Yeah, I'm chair of the Emancipation Day celebration. If you're still here, you should partake. There's a parade and a big luncheon at my hotel. You have a hotel? No, you're staying in it. Oh, what a coincidence. <laughs> yeah, we start at sunrise with a service at the Episcopal at the Episcopal Church. Oh, a tad early for me. Yeah, the city will be buzzing with energy. You will not be able to stay in bed. <laughs> if you say so. You'll come then. If I'm still here next month. Uh, it's a wonderful day. I hope that America will soon follow Canada's example. <laughs> you don't think it's possible? Well, not in my lifetime. Why not? Well, let's just say I understand why businessmen would balk at suddenly having to pay for something. In this case, labor that's always been free. <laughs> so they hold human beings in bondage. I uh, have done for over two centuries. It's as normal to them as a... Uh, well, I can't think of what. Not that I'm excusing them. But. So why did Canada see the light? I have a theory. Go on. The weather. This should be interesting. No, plantations down south work year-round. There's no incentive for those farmers to change, but up here there's a good six months when nothing's being planted, grown or harvested. But the workers still have to be fed and sheltered. That's a huge financial loss. Hmm. I never thought of that. Hmm. I suppose I should give some credit to Queen Victoria. She decreed emancipation in the colonies. A remarkable woman. It took her long enough. I've been outlawed in England since the turn of the century. America will be next, Baptista. You will eat your words. Oh, gladly, my friend. Gladly. We could use a man like you in Toronto. <laughs> What would I do? Well, people are here moving every day. Find out what they want and sell it to them. You make it sound so easy. Well, stay a while. You'll see. Kate enters. She sees Peter. Oh, no. Kate, this is Peter Thomas. Peter, my daughter, Katerina. Lovely to meet you. No flowers? That's not what you think, my dear. Is there something wrong? I trust my ad was in the livestock section. I have no dealings with livestock. His saddle is being repaired in my shop. What do you take me for? He's here for the dowry. Dowry? Who's offering a dowry in this day and age? Kate looks at Baptista, who looks away from her. Really? It's not an uncommon practice. How could you? Come, come. We are having such a pleasant conversation. About the evils of slavery. Do you not see the hypocrisy? It's hardly the same thing. It's pretty damn close. Listen, a woman has to marry well. Of her own free will. We are of differing opinions, sir. 
but I do not appreciate being spoken this way in my own home. It's true. He really doesn't like it. Kate. You're right. I'm sorry. Thank you. I mean to say that it isn't my place to judge. I think I had too much to drink. I had better go. Thank you for your hospitality. Good day. Good day to you, miss. Peter exits. I don't recall you ever bringing a customer back to the house. Well, I ran into him at the hotel. He asked me where the livery was. I was on my way, so we traveled together. Well, what a likable fellow. Of course you like him. He's patronizing two of your businesses. Well, that did endear him to me. Barely a week after he placed that ad. A coincidence. Father, you can be so gullible. Gullible men do not amass wealth as I have. The inheritance from the people who owned your father also helped. Oh, that sharp tongue of yours. Is that what? Is that why you want to get rid of me? I want what's best for you. It doesn't feel that way. Face the facts, Kate. You aren't getting any younger. Now who has the sharp tongue? Your mother says that we are too much alike. Only our complexions. Hmm. I do take blame for that. Blame? <laughs> you haven't passed on a deadly disease. Well... I'm not ashamed of my skin, father. Do you want me to be? I just want you to respect me. Give me the dowry. Don't be ridiculous. Why should I depend on a husband? What a question. Other women have supported themselves. Black women? Yes. Name one. Well, uh, what's her name? You see? Just let me think. You do like men, don't you, Kate? They don't like me very much. Captain the Cursed. Don't call me that. True. I am the cursed one with a strong-willed, ungrateful daughter. You forgot to mention Dark. I'm your strong-willed, ungrateful, dark daughter. Mary Ann Shad. She strides off again. Poor Baptista. Scene five, Baptista's office. There is a model of the city on a table. He's trying to read a rolled up topographical map. Peter enters. Peter! Mr. Manola. Well, two days ago you called me Batista. Yes, well. Until I met with your disapproval. I apologize. It was none of my business. Not yet. Beg pardon? Well, I trust that your saddle and, and bridle are in good working order? Oh, yes. Very much. But your man told me to come here with the bill. Yes, I asked him. Why? Help me with this, would you? He gives Peter the map. Just hold this flat on the wall. Can't make heads nor tail of it when it keeps curling up. Peter flattens the large map onto a wall. Baptista studies it. How's this? Good. Ah. I see. If a bill, if a bridge was built here over the river, we could cut down on a considerable amount of travel time on the hypotenuse. Just have a, just have to convince the city to clear the land. <laughs> Baptista moves a few figures on the table. It seems like he's forgotten Peter. Yes, excellent. <laughs> Do you still need me to? Ah, no, my boy. Thank you. Peter takes down the scroll and gives it back to Baptista. You are welcome. Uh, will you be leaving now that your livery is sorted? Some business is keeping me here longer than I'd planned. Well, it's good to see that your feelings about me are not souring your opinion of Toronto. Business is business. Too true. Speaking of which... Peter takes a wad of bills from his pocket. What if you were to look at that money as a down payment? For what? I'm looking to expand my coach service. Go as far as Kingston. Where's that? About ten days east. Ten days. Well, if you don't mind my saying... Yes? I think that it would be an expensive proposition. Go on. Well, ten days there and ten back means that you'll be without a driver and team for twenty days. You'd only be making one trip per month. 
there's no profit in that unless you only have rich customers who could charge through the nose. But the rich usually have their own carriages. Those are good points. I'm sorry. So if my coaches only went as far as Brighton, about six days one way, I'd be able to have two trips per month. But you said Kingston. Yeah, my brother Martin is based in Kingston. We're starting the service together. I'm not following. Well, his passengers would buy tickets to Toronto. Mine would buy tickets to Kingston. Both coaches would meet in Brighton. And after a night stay in our hotel, switch passengers and turn back. So gone for just 12 days, not 20. Why, that's genius. We'll figure out what people want and sell it to them. How many business will this make for you? Four? Five? <laughs> I hadn't thought to count. I'm starting to understand the potential of this city. Well, there's money here for anyone who wants to put the work in. Now I'm suddenly in need for more horses. Baptista takes the money that Peter had set down and holds it out to him. Peter smiles. He takes the money and they shake hands. I'd be happy to oblige. Well done, my boy. Scene six, the Manola house sitting room. Kate is reading. Peter and Aoife enter. He is carrying her parcels. Oh, thank you so much. It is no trouble at all. You again. That's right, you met. I ran into your mother on the street. Another coincidence. I would have lost half these parcels in the mud if it were not for this generous young man. I thought that you were only going to buy them. I simply couldn't resist the beautiful new fabric. You can just set them here, Peter. He puts the packages on a table. Thank you. My pleasure, Mrs. Manoa. Oh, please call me Aoife. What a lovely name. I have never heard it before. It's Irish. I thought that I heard a lute. I've been here since I was 11 and it still does creep in. <laughs> lovely. Just lovely. Kate, please. Aoife has taken a perfume bottle from her purse and sprays it liberally around her head and upper body. Peter gasps and rubs one of his eyes. Oh, dear, did I get it on you? Oh, it was nothing. What happened? Oh, I blinded him with my perfume. Oh, it's just a slight irritation. Oh, how clumsy of me. I have to get the smell of horse manure off me when I come home. Peter is dabbing his eye with his handkerchief. It's, I'm fine, really. Oh, let me see, open your eye. He takes the handkerchief away. Kate, give me your book. Why? Aoife gives her a look. All right. Kate gives it to her and stays close to observe. Aoife holds the book up to Peter's face. Now, close the other eye. Can you read this? Um. I'll never forgive myself. I'm so sorry. You mistake me, my dear. I have a high respect for your nerves. They are my old friends. I have heard you mention them with consideration these 20 years, at least. Aoife, who was confused at first, is now delighted. That was wonderful, my dear. You are an excellent reader. Isn't he, Kate? Kate reaches out her hand for the book. Aoife hands it to her and Kate goes back to her seat. As I said, I'm fine. Will you stay for tea? Oh, how kind. Kate. <clears throat> uh, but no, I'd best get going. Uh, some other time. We shall see. Good day. Good day. Peter exits. Kate is still reading. You must know that book by heart. I like reading about women who stand up to men. As I recall, she marries the fellow anyway, despite her initial obligations. She made him work for it. Her stubbornness could have made her entire family destitute. Fortunately, my family's wealth doesn't depend on me marrying anyone. Plus, this was written ages ago. 1813. Darling, that was the year I was born. Well, a lot has changed since then. Women don't have to ingratiate themselves to men anymore in order, in order not to starve to death. At least I don't think so. Darling, he's a lovely man. I don't trust him. Oh, 
nonsense. He's trust personified. Let me call him back. As you wish. Excellent. Kate stands. I shall be reading in my room. Uh, never mind then. Would you like to see my purchases? Love to. Aoife holds up a section of fabric. Does it suit me? It's beautiful, Mother. Oh, mother of the bride. Perfect. Bianca will approve. Aoife opens her other parcel. Oh, I adore this one. Mother, it's beautiful. I'm spoiling myself, I know. What's the occasion? For your wedding. Mother. But if there's a double wedding, I'll only need one of them. Kate ignores this. Like in the book. I wonder if books by Black women have broader ranges of subject matter. I'll see if I can find some for you. Aoife gathers up all her purchases with ease. Let me help you with those. Oh, it's only a few steps. Aoife leaves. Kate goes back to her reading. After a moment, there's a knock at the door. Kate, still holding her book, goes to the door and opens it to Peter. Miss Manola. Miss Manola. What is it now? Oh dear, I have annoyed you again. An astute observation. Your mother dropped one of her parcels after all, it seems. He holds out a muddy packet with two fingers. It's covered in mud. Use my glove. He starts to take it off. Just leave it on the table. I don't want to soil the wood. The mud will soon dry. The maid can brush it away. Very clever. So my father tells me. Not that he means it as a compliment. Well, I do. Must be the ribbon. I don't think so. He shakes the package, which creates a rattling sound before placing it on the table. She sits with her book. Thank you for the loan of your book earlier. I had no choice in the matter. It's by one of those English lady writers, isn't it? Yes. She makes a grand flourish of turning a page. I prefer the company of my book than that of a man who would think that I am so naive as to believe that he is not here because of the money attached to me. Peter's eye is really bothering him and leaves with his handkerchief held to his eye. Bianca enters. Deny it if you will. Who are you talking to? Kate wheels around. Oh, he's gone. Oh, the man who helped Mother with her parcels? Yes, him. Mother said that he'd left after you were exceptionally rude. He came back with that. Oh, more treats from Lavinia's? Careful of the mud. Bianca tears open the packet and spills buttons onto the table. Buttons? <laughs> hey, look. How stunning. He bought them for you? He said that Mother dropped them on the road. Mother showed me all her purchases. She would have noticed if those weren't among them. Someone else must have dropped them. Shall we keep them? No, we shall not. Kate places them into her handkerchief. She holds out her hand to Bianca. Busted, Bianca drops two buttons into Kate's hand. Kate adds them to the others. I will return them to the shop. Such a respectable young lady. How would it look if the rightful owner of if the rightful owner saw us around the city with her buttons sewn to our dresses? The daughters of a councilman. Oh, Kate. Would you like to come with me? The cakes have just come out of the oven. Uh, save one for me, please. I will. Oh, and Kate? Yes? At least he is young. Goodbye, Bianca. And handsome too, according to mother. Goodbye. Kate leaves. Scene seven. Kate is waiting in the hotel lobby. Peter enters. Uh, Miss Manola, the bellman should have said it was you. What a lovely- I'm these. Oh, the buttons. The shop described the American man who bought them. No need to keep lying. 
Lying is such a harsh word. You deny it, then? No, I bought them for you. Why? Well, I just wanted to... To... To woo me? No. Why else do men give women gifts? I've given you no encouragement. You have not. Why would you show me such kindness? You deserve kindness. Your father is showing, showing such deplorable unkindness. I saw the buttons in the shop window. I was going to make a grand speech, tell you how much you deserve something pretty, and I lost my nerve and made up that story about finding them in the mud. You dropped them on purpose? No. That was that part was an accident. I meant no offense. I am not offended. That's a relief. It might be hard for you to believe, but my father is an honorable man. That is quite loyal of you. He gets something into his head, and it's impossible to convince him that there might be another way to look at it. You may recognize the trait in someone else. Not at all. Liar. <laughs> <laughs> Would it be brash of me to ask if I could... If you could... You know what I'm asking, surely. Uh, oh, these? He holds up the buttons. She nods. I won't force you to say the words. Kate begins to say something. He cuts her off. <laughs> yes. I know that I could never force you to do anything. He hands over the buttons. Thank you. They are beautiful. Enjoy them. I will. We are friends, then? What would be the point? I see. Since you're going back to America. Well, I'm not so sure of that anymore. Why not? I think I might be better suited to this country. You might not think so when winter arrives. <laughs> I am sure that I would adjust. Yes, well, I thank you for the buttons. You are quite welcome, Miss Manola. Kate. Kate, good day. He turns to leave. Peter. Yes? I hadn't realized how late it had become. Yes? Could I trouble you to walk me home? Oh, I would love to. She reaches for his arm. However, I fear I have another commitment. Oh. I am sorry. I owe you another apology for leaving your home earlier without saying goodbye. It was horrifically rude of you. No, it was my eye. Oh, from the perfume. Yes, I did not want your mother to worry. Please don't tell her. Your secret is safe with me. So I'm just off to see the doctor now. Oh, no. Just a precautionary measure. That is wise of you. It does look quite angry. Yes, and the good doctor is nowhere near your house, I'm afraid. No matter. I will take a carriage. Yes, good. Uh, now, I really must go. Take good care. I will. Thank you. Peter exits. Kate gives the buttons another admiring look. Scene 8. The Manola sitting room. Baptista is reading through a stack of letters. Aoife is sewing a dress from the new fabric. Good Lord. Another stellar candidate. <sighs> Dear Mr. Manola, I'd be happy to marry the young mulatto. She's older than I would have hoped, but I trust that she is a good worker and will show obedience to me as her husband. Stop. I cannot leave the farm until after harvest. Would you agree to sending her with the dowry? You will marry at the Methodist church before journeying to the farm. No more, Baptista. Not one suitable man. I did warn you. I don't know what to do. You might not have to do anything. Meaning? Her visits with Peter have been getting longer and longer. Peter Thomas? She means for it to be a secret. Do you mean they have formed some sort of a... 
I don't know what to call it. How long has this been going on? Mm, a few weeks. She meets him at the hotel almost every day. My very own hotel. Is it, is it all very above board? They met in the lobby. They then take a carriage to some public place for tea or a walk. When did she tell you? She didn't. I still have friends on staff. Uh, why, this is wonderful. Listen to me. If you interfere in any way, she will turn her back on him just to spite you. What do I do? Go about your business. Some of my business is at the hotel. She has made a point of meeting with him when you were at City Hall. Oh, clever girl. She gets it from you. Uh, Katrina may have found a man who can tolerate her. Where were your boys? Oh, I want to shout it for the rooftops. Pista. Tell me that you are not as excited as I am. One moment. She goes, looks outside the door, and closes it. I'm bloody well excited. <laughs> he takes her in his arms and dances her around with joy. Oh, how was I ever lucky enough to find you? I was the one lucky enough to be cleaning rooms in your hotel. Filthy from head to toe and the most beautiful woman in the world. And it took you only six months to talk to me. Where my heart was pounding out of my chest. I hope that both our girls find our kind of happiness. Me too, my dear. I thank you for putting up with me. My darling, you are easy to love. Hmm. Liar. Big kiss. Scene nine. Bianca and Kate are decorating the hotel. They are trying to hang a Happy Emancipation Day banner. How's this? Still not straight. We're missing the parade. Since when do you care about the parade? I was hoping to meet a friend there. Which friend? Why can't the staff do this? Well, they have enough to do. At least they're getting paid. Well, of course. Instead, two black women are being forced to work for no remuneration on a day where we celebrate the emancipation of black people. Eva enters. Mother, I didn't see you. Apparently not. Is the banner all right? Still a little crooked. It will do. What would you like us to do now? Nothing. You can go about your business. But I can manage the rest of the staff. I bet you'd need us all morning. The rooms look lovely. Thank you both. Mother. Eva has left. Bianca stares down Kate. It was a joke. You know how sensitive she is. She had to hold us so close whenever we went out or people would think that we were two little black girls alone. No one thinks that anymore. She's the only one in the family who isn't black and you keep reminding her of how different she is. What's wrong with being white? Why do I even bother? Peter enters. Oh, hello. Hello. Did you enjoy the parade? Yes, very much. My name is Peter. Oh, Pe Peter. Buttons, Peter? That's me. You must be Bianca. I am. She was just leaving. Yes, yes. Our mother was recently upset. Oh, dear. Bianca, she's fine. I'll just make sure, shall I? Goodbye, Peter. Katerina. Bianca exits. I can tell she's mad at me when she uses my proper name or calls me sister. What happened? My mouth got me into trouble again. Never mind. It's so good to see you. She looks around to make sure that no one is around and gives him a subtle kiss. I have some news. Good, I hope. I'm going back to America. No. Only for six months. Six months? Maybe five. I must settle my affairs there. Then I can stay here forever. That's the good news. It's a long time for us to be apart so early in our... In our friendship. He moves in to kiss her again. She evades him, not sure if they are alone. And we won't spend Christmas together. I hadn't thought of that.
There must be another way. You could come with me. Father would never allow his unmarried daughter to travel with a man unchaperoned. I know. Why even suggest it? I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Peter... For a smart woman, it does take you a while sometimes. What are you talking about? We could travel together if we were married. Well, yes, but we're not. Oh. You understand now? But we've known each other for such a short time. I feel like I've known you forever. This is happening so quickly. Fine, then. We can wait until I get back in the new year. No! So marry me now. Right now? I leave next week. Can we squeeze in a wedding before then? Not if that's how you're going to ask me. I suppose you'd want a ring in your father's approval? I might be a modern woman, but there are some things that I have that have to be done the right way. Is that your father over there? Kate turns to look. I don't see him. She turns back. Peter is down on one knee, holding out a ring box. But my father... I asked him this morning. You did? He said yes. Your mother too. Oh, Peter. Katerina Manola, will you be my wife? Yes, yes, I will. He puts the ring on her finger. She said yes! <laughs> There's the sound of a champagne cork popping. Bianca, Ifa, and Baptista enter with a bottle and glasses. Baptista goes to Peter and pumps his hand enthusiastically. You all know- I just found out. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about being the last to know. Don't ruin this case. To the happy couple, may they have a long life together filled with love and success. They all drink, Kate and Peter kiss. There will be plenty of time for that. Now, we have a wedding to plan. Come, Kate. Oh, I'm coming too. She takes Kate's arm. I've collected a few items over the years for your trousseau. Really? Miraculously, the church is free this Saturday morning. We'll have the reception in the ball at the hotel. Now, the honeymoon suite is reserved for Mr. and Mrs. Thomas. Not 10 minutes ago, I was trying to decide how to tell you that Peter and I had been courting, and now you've all planned the next chapter of my life. Well, no point in waiting. But Father, you are always telling me that I'm too impulsive. Only in your speech, my dear. Wait, she's right, everyone. I am? Oh, Kate. I've taken over your life just the way you accused your father of doing on that very day we met. How thoughtless of me. It's just that it's so forbidden. Six months isn't that long. Right, everyone? The following is a half-hearted consensus from Bianca, Baptista, and Aoife. No. Yeah, not long at all. Wait. You really wouldn't mind, Peter? We will write to each other. Oh, you, you could get married on St. Valentine's Day. A winter wedding. We'd have more time to plan. How do you feel about your attendants having accents in aubergine, uh, accents in aubergine velvet? Oh, that would be nice. Yes, very nice. Kate takes in the false enthusiasm. No, let's stick with our summer wedding. The group gives a resounding cheer. Hey! Good. That is settled. Kate, you go with your mother and sister. We men have to discuss yes, come business. Kate. You can't spare a minute. All right. Until later, my love. Kate waves goodbye and finally notices her ring. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I was wondering when you'd say something. She rushes back and kisses him again. It's beautiful. Just like you. Yanka pulls her away, and the three women exit. You made her so happy. We're all happy. So am I. Thank you, son. Thank you for your blessing. Ah, now you earn this fair and square. He holds out a thick envelope from his 
Quack. Oh, oh no, I couldn't possibly. Dear boy, I insist. I am in no need of it. But Peter. I can provide for my wife. You are indeed a man of noble character. Thank you. Baptista takes some of the money and holds out a portion of it to Peter. I might as well give you this now, since you'll be gone when they arrive. When who arrive? My new horses. This is the balance of what I owe you. Oh, yes, of course. My mind is elsewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's love for you. Yes, love indeed. Now, I have to ask, why would it take so long to settle your affairs? There are properties and investments in several states. Plus, I might have to sail to England. You don't say. I have an interest in tobacco plantations. The harvest is being shipped to London. Well, you can hitch a ride, can you? I hope so. Then I can dissolve my English partnership in person. Yeah, and give Kate a grand honeymoon. She deserves it. More likely to be eight months if you take the weather into consideration. Quite possibly. I'll be sure to send letters whenever we can. That will mean so much to her mother. And me as well. Yes. I feel that you always mistrust the love I have for Kate. Not at all. Yeah, I want the best for her. I know that you do. Kate's life will be easier with you by her side. I will do my best. Peter drains the last of his champagne. Now, let's celebrate with a real drink. What an excellent idea. Scene 10, Manola's sitting room. Bianca is loosening Aoife's shoelaces. They shrunk. Well, more likely that your feet are swollen, all that dancing. Well worth it. Will you have a new pair made for my wedding? Your sister hasn't even gone on her honeymoon. Give me a chance to get used to the idea of one daughter being married. All right, mother. She pulls off the shoes. Oh, that's wonderful. Kate enters. She's wearing a dress accessorized with the buttons from Peter. She's carrying her bouquet. Hello? Kate? Why aren't you at the hotel? Change of plans. We're spending the night in Niagara Falls instead. But what about the honeymoon suite? Father understands. Oh, we were supposed to have family brunch in the morning. I know, Mother. It's just that, well, Peter hasn't had, so Peter has had so little to do with the planning this way. The poor man is outnumbered. He's truly grateful that you took it all in hand. But, but he wanted something really special, a place that was new for both of us. Niagara Falls, how romantic. We should get there by tomorrow afternoon. So you will be traveling on your wedding night? I don't mind at all. Well, as long as your father approves. He does. They're smoking disgusting cigars at this moment. Peter promises me that it's his last one. I will miss you so much, my darling. Me too. I'll miss both of you. The next time I see you, you will be, it'll be just before my wedding. Bianca. Well, it will be. Unless you're with child, it wouldn't be a good idea to travel the bumpy roads in your condition. I am not in any condition yet, mother. Forgive your poor mother for getting excited. I almost didn't believe that this day would come. Me neither. Me neither. Enough. <laughs> Katerina the Cursed is no more. <laughs> Best not to keep your husband waiting. I want to make sure. I, I don't want to interrupt the dowry business. Peter, Peter feels so ashamed for taking it. So why is he? He got swindled by a breeder in Kentucky. Oh, awful. Did he lose all of his money? A fair amount. And the horses that father had bought, too. Oh, no. Peter's going to pay him back. Every penny. I am so happy that you found each other. 
Don't you dare cry, mother. I won't. I won't. Kate, come now, would you? He's been so impatient since the ceremony. Darling, remember what I told you about how it could be with men? It may seem like they're angry or distracted, but they're actually trying to contain themselves until they get to the bedroom. Yes, mother. I'd best be going. I'll stay here. My feet. Yes, of course. They embrace. I'll come wave you off. Kate and Bianca leave. Nifa massages her feet. After a moment, she hears the sound of the carriage departing. She wipes tears from her eyes. Baptista and Bianca enter. Bianca is carrying the wedding bouquet. Look what Kate gave me! Oh, how sweet. She kisses her parents goodnight. Good night. And sleep well, my dear. Good night. Baptista takes over the foot massage. <sighs> Thank you, my love. You're already missing her. I've never been away from her, and now she will be gone for months. They'll be back before you know it. And then, Bianca, what will we do in this big house all by ourselves? Uh, we'll worry about that when the time comes. You're right, my dear. Is that enough? Mm, just a little longer. All right, as long as you want, my dear. Baptista continues massaging her feet. Scene 11, in the moving carriage. Peter holds the reins. Kate has her arm through the crook of his right arm and rests her head on his shoulder. Can you believe that we are actually married? That's what the certificate says. How much longer? Five hours. So long. Including the rest stop for the horses. We're making good time. Good. Oh, my button's loose. She pulls a button from her sleeve and puts it in her purse. To think, if, to think if it were, if it weren't for that little button, I may not have fallen in love with you. She kisses his cheek, then yawns. Get some sleep. I want to keep you company. It's difficult to drive with you so close to me. You'll have to get used to having me by your side. She snuggles in closer. Kate, please. These dark roads, I have to concentrate. I'm sorry. She goes to kiss him again. He pulls away. Not now, Kate. Oh, my mother warned me about this. About what? Never mind. Just wake me when we're closer. I will. Kate curls up away from Peter. He gives her a look. There is no love in his expression. Act two, scene one. Inside a rundown shack, Kate is wearing plain work clothes. She is folding her going away dress in brown paper and string. When she finishes, Peter takes it and puts it in his bag. He sits and writes. Where are we? Buffalo. You're writing a letter? Keep quiet, will you? To whom? To whom? You'll not be putting on airs like that when you get to your new home. My new home? I'm trying to concentrate. Peter. Don't call me that. But it's your name. He gives her a look. Oh. He continues writing. She moves the curtain to look outside the window. Stay away from the window. He handles her roughly as she pulls her back and closes the curtain. Just do as I say. I've put too much work into you, into this for to go wrong now. He goes back to writing. But why? Ten thousand dollars. You did see the ad. You pretended to care for me just for the money. Nearly gave up a few times. You try the patience of a saint. You don't love me even a little. Can't wait to be rid of you. He finishes writing, puts the pen down, and reads the letter to himself. This should give me a good head start. You've written to my parents. Buying time. I'll be long gone by the time they get suspicious. I can't believe that I didn't see this cruel 
before. You thought you were so smart. What happens now? Your master is somewhat delayed. She slaps him. He grabs her wrist. You're lucky I promised you in good condition. But try that again, and I'll get you where your bruises don't show. Not that anything would show on that skin. She pulls her hand free and slaps him again. He moves to strike her. She stands her ground. He stops shy of hitting her, his hand hovering in the air. You might as well. I won't risk it. Let me go. You can keep the money. <laughs> of course I'll keep it. And there's even more to come from my southern friend. I know different than one of your horses. Now you're catching on. I'll take this, too. He snatches the rings from her finger. You're a horrible man. She sits on the bed. How you thought that I would want to be with you. It's not so strange. My parents. Your mother raises the status of your father. You would just bring me down. You were supposed to raise my status. At the expense of my own. Are you crazy? My status doesn't matter, then. Not where you're going. She reaches for her purse. Hand that over. Can I have my handkerchief? No. But I've wiped my nose with it. All right. Keep it. She takes the handkerchief from the purse. He snatches the purse from her. She wipes her eyes, blows her nose, and puts the handkerchief in her cleavage. A carriage approaches. At last. Peter opens the door. Kate kicks him in the crotch and runs out, leaving him doubled over. Help me! Somebody please help me! Peter tries to catch his breath while speaking to the driver of the carriage. Grab her before someone sees her. Get away from me! Careful, she's got a rock. The sound of Kate grunting with effort, the rock making contact, then a man grimacing. Are you going to let her get away with that? The sound of Kate being slapped. Get your hands off me. I told you she was spirited. He has recovered somewhat and picks up a coil of rope. I earn my money with this one. Hold her steady. He hobbles outside with the rope as we hear Kate struggling. No, help me. Shut her up, would you? Let go. Suddenly her mo voice is muffled. <sighs> That's more like it. Scene two, the Manola house. Aoife is in the sitting room. The carriage is pulling away. Baptista enters. Anything? No. Oh, this is pure agony. Bianca comes rushing in. Was that the post? Maybe tomorrow. You always say that. Oh, they must have gone to England. He sits and starts reading his newspaper. People on honeymoon can be quite oblivious to everything going on around them. Oh, don't worry, my dear. I'm sure they'll be here for your wedding. And if they're not... Your sister will make it up to you. She better. Noticing a stack of books. Are those for Kate? Yes. Might as well get organized for Christmas. More Jane Austen? No, I ordered some books authored by black women. Kate said she was interested. I haven't heard of any of them. There are many more than I would have thought. I wonder if she even thinks about us. Of course she does. All we got was that Bruce letter from Peter. Goodness. A ship carrying the mail went down in a storm last month. Mother, that must be it. Yes, it must be. It has put my mind at ease. Though I feel terrible for the passengers. How many were lost? It doesn't say. We'll hear from her soon, my dear. You always say that. I trust your father. He picks up his pipe. Outside, please. As you wish, my dear. He leaves. I wish that Kate could see just how much he misses her. I expect she's surprised how much she misses him, too. Bianca picks up one of the books and starts flipping through it. Are they all American? I think so. All about slavery, I assume. It's so sad. There's actually some fascinating poetry. She opens a book to a specific page. Here, 
a double standard. Do you blame me that I loved him? If, when standing all alone, I cried for bread, a careless world pressed to my lips a stone. Do you blame me that I loved him, that my heart beat glad and free when he told me in the sweetest tones he loved but only me? Can you blame me that I did not see beneath his burning kiss? Oh my goodness. I told you. Was she writing about her master? Must have been. Keep going. Oh, I can't read this and to my mother. <laughs> you, you can hang on to it then. Thank you. You sure about the wedding, my dear? I won't get married without my sister. Oh, how does Luke feel about it? Those are my terms. Oh, my beautiful girls. Oh, don't get tears on the paper, mother. I'll try not to. She gives her mother a supportive squeeze on her arm. Scene three, outside a cabin in the Southern US, Kate and Naomi, a native woman, are wringing out laundry. Kate stops to massage her hands. Kate, you have to keep working. They can't see what I'm doing from the distance. It's not worth the risk. I'm sure it looks like I'm washing, look. Kate lowers her hands into the basin, but does no work. Naomi stops working and massages her own hands at the basin too. <laughs> you are a smart woman. Then how did I end up here? Don't start with that again. You don't know the life that I came from. You will get used to it here. The Griffins are good people. It isn't possible for good people to own other people. They are better than the last ones I was with. What were they like? Naomi shakes her head. I'm sorry. That's enough rest. She returns to her work. Naomi, I'm sorry. Kate reaches for her and winces in pain. You need more self. Yes, I think so. Kate sits with her back to Naomi, who lifts up Kate's shirt. There are blood stains on the back of it. She starts to apply ointment. Is this too hard? No, it's fine, thank you. You're healing well, no infection. Small mercies. Sit still. Sorry. Almost done. It smells so good. Honey, mixed with flowering yarrow. It will help with the scarring. Thank you. Better? Yes. Thanks, Naya. Naomi finishes. Kate pulls down her shirt. Naomi washes her hands in one of the tubs. Make sure they see the blood on your shirt. Why? So they won't put you out in the field too early. They won't want these wounds to open again. I won't last in the fields. <laughs> you don't know what you're capable of. I can't stay here. That's the kind of talk that will keep the beatings coming. Oh, God. Back to work. At least we're almost done. Naomi picks up a hidden pile of more dirty clothes. Not quite. Where did you get those from? We keep the clothes that need mending separate. You get started on them and I'll hang these up. All right. Kate All right. stirs the laundry with a huge paddle. Naomi begins to sing to herself. What's that song? I don't know. I've just always known it. How can you sing here, living like this? Li living this life? So that I don't forget? Dear of home. Bits and pieces. I miss home more than I thought possible. I'll get back there. How? I'll think of a way. We can leave together. This family is good to me. They really are not good to you. It's better than living the life of a runaway. I can't give in to this. You would be breaking the law. Not where I come from. We are lucky to be here. They only beat us when we do something wrong. Other places, they don't need reasons. 
It may be lesser of two evils, but it's still evil. Kate has stopped stirring. You can work and talk at the same time. Fine. Kate reluctantly starts stirring again. You are not used to labor. I have made most of my own clothes since I was a teenager. That isn't what I would call labor. Most of the other young women in my set don't sew. My mother taught me that it was important skill. Oh, how I miss her. Think about other things. Like what? If some of the clothing is too far gone, you can make new clothes for yourself. That would be allowed. Mrs. Griffin appreciates frugality. Oh, did I tell you that she's expecting a baby? How nice for her. I hope that this one lives. She was miscarried? Several times, and a stillbirth last year. That's why they bought me from the other family. I helped the old master's wife give birth to a healthy baby after many years of sadness. How? I gave her herbs to help with the pains and the bleeding. Where did you get them? I foraged them from the woods. Do you know the properties of the plant? The properties of the plants in this region? Most of them. Can I come with you next time you go? <laughs> you will try to run away again. We'll both get beatings. I've learned my lesson. I promise. I will go when the moon is full. When is that? Two weeks. My back will be much better by then. I'll be able to help you. All right. What's ready this time of year? Watercress, reindeer moss, uh, deerad cycle. Deerad cycle? It sounds like a religious gathering. It's a mushroom. There's a scraping sound from the wash tub. What was that? Stop stirring. She does. Now, stir again. She does. The sound of scraping happens again. Good. A dime, maybe. Help me. She reaches into the water and searches. Kate follows suit. Got it. They look at the coin in her hand. A penny. That won't do much. It adds up. She holds out her hand and Kate gives her the penny. Naomi removes a tin can from a hiding place. She adds the penny and shakes the can, which jangles. How much have you gotten there? Shh. He puts the tin back. It's our secret, right? It's safe with me, but where do you spend it? Sometimes I buy things from the rag and bone man. Really? Or tray. What do you buy? Oh, this and that. A mirror. The tin I keep the salve in. What else does he sell? Tobacco, chocolate, ale, paper. Paper? Did he sell envelopes too? Sure. He's got so much on that card of his, and if he doesn't have what you're looking for, he remembers for next time. I don't get something every time, but it's nice to look. I can't wait to meet him. See? There are nice moments. Those are what will keep you going. Thanks, Naomi. They continue with the laundry. Scene five, the Manola house. Christmas time. Aoife and Bianca are wrapping gifts. The carriage arrives. It's father. He's early. Baptista enters. Darling, was there anything in the post? I am utterly confused. Father? He staggers. Both women rush to his aid. Baptista, what is it? Say something, father. Baptista hands Aoife a letter. What is it? Is it from Kate? Yes. Why, that's wonderful. No, Aoife, it's not. What happened? But Baptista can't speak. She begins to read it. Her confusion deepens more and more as Baptista weeps. Bianca stays with him. Her mother's face shows great distress. Mother? Be quiet, Bianca, please. Would you like some water, Father? Baptista grabs her and holds her tight. Don't go, my dear daughter. Stay right here. 
All right, Father, I will. Scene six, the cabin. Peter is terrorizing Naomi. Where is she? I don't know. He holds up Kate's work clothes. You helped her escape. No, I didn't. You think you're protected? The mistress needs me. Well, probably haven't heard. There's a very good midwife. Just moved to town. Last week, she delivered a set of triplets healthy as horses. You're not so special after all. Please. So, if I were to break a few fingers... I don't know where she is. We'll see about that. He grabs her hand. Stop! Leave her alone! Kate is dressed as a boy. So that was your plan, to pass herself off as a boy. Please, let her go. It's me that you want. You're just lucky that I found out before the Griffins did. He lets go of Naomi, who runs to the house. You wouldn't have gotten far. I was just walking. I'd finished my work. Oh, you just finished your work. Yes. So you can take your evening constitutional. I didn't think that I'd done anything wrong. The Griffins are old friends. They told me that you were difficult, wanted me to school you or take you back. Please, Peter. Call me master. A short while ago, I called you my, I called you husband. Looks like I have to break you in some more. No, you don't. I'll be good. I promise. I promise, master. He starts to take off his belt. I promise, master. Now, that wasn't so bad, was it? Kate doesn't answer. I said that wasn't so bad, was it? No, it wasn't. He whacks the belt on a surface, making her jump. No, it wasn't, master. We both know that as soon as I leave, you'll come up with some other plan to get out of here. As soon as you open your mouth, people will know that you've been educated. I can't help the way that I speak. Maybe I should cut out your tongue. No, please don't, Master. I don't want to have to come back here again. I've been racking my brain, trying to figure out a way to guarantee that you'd not cause any more trouble. Then I came across our marriage certificate. That's not... Valid? Legal? Is that what you were going to say? I wasn't going to say anything, Master. No one would question the validity of the documents presented by such an esteemed gentleman as I. It's within my rights to commit you to an asylum for the mentally defective. In one of the northern states, of course, they'd have you chained up all day. Doing laundry doesn't seem so bad now, does it? Kate looks does down. It. She shakes her head. Now, I'm having dinner with the Griffins. I've placed a lookout right there. You can go ahead and wave to Johnny. Kate reluctantly waves. When I come back from dinner, you tell me if you'll stay here and behave yourself, or if I take you to the asylum. He raises his hand as if to strike her. She flinches. He laughs while exiting. <sighs> Scene 7. The Manola House. The family is distraught. It makes no sense. Let me, Mother. Dear Mr. Manola, I loved visiting your family while I was in Toronto with my husband, Peter Thomas. Your wife had admired the buttons on my dress. It turned out that I had an extra one which is enclosed. Maybe she can use it in one of her sewing projects? If you are ever to find yourselves in Mercer County, Kentucky, please ask for the Griffin House. It's green with white shutters and large white pillars. I would be very happy to see you again. Katerina Thomas. I thought at first it was some kind of joke. After all this time, she would send us a joke? She's written in, in code. She, she must be afraid that somebody might intercept the letter. Well, she's in trouble. Let me read it again. How many times do you need to read it to understand that our child... I can't even say it. Mother, do you think that Kate is a slave? Oh, my poor child. This is your fault. I don't say that, Aoife. You put a price on her head. I did. I did. 
Now you have to get her back. Yes, yes, I must. I'll leave right away. No, Father, you won't be safe down there. No, I will carry my papers and dress in my finest clothes. You'll be accused of stealing these clothes and forging the papers. I have to do something. You are a counselor. Wouldn't the city have resources to help us? I fear that the government would move too slowly. I have an idea. A horrible idea. Tell us. End of scene. Scene eight, the Southern Cabin. Naomi and Kate are bundling up herbs and grasses, hanging them to dry. It looks like he'll be here for a while. He's watching me, testing me. He is just as cruel as you said he was. I'm sorry that he hurt you when he first got here. <laughs> he didn't hurt me. I saw him grabbing you. You were crying. I only let him think he hurt me. That's good. I'm glad. You're a different person since he got here. If I had been obedient to my father, none of this would have happened. I would have married a nice man named George. I'd have a house on Nickel Creek. We'd have a sitting room just like my parents have, and my sister would come over to play music for our guests. I should have been grateful for my wealth and status, but all I did was complain. When so many people have it, so much worse. Someone's coming. It's him. Kate bows her head and waits. Aoife and Baptista enter. Kate! Mother! Oh, my poor girl. Sabrina. He embraces her. Father, why are you dressed that way? It was your father's idea. Darling, it's the only way we could have traveled here. You have to go. He's coming back to check on me. I will keep watch. Naomi leaves. We'll go together. I can't. I have to stay. What? But your letter. I sent it before you. He... I can't defy you. Peter no. enters. No, she can't. You. Please just let them go. I'll do whatever you want. I know you will. I should kill you. You could try. Father, please. We've contacted the Canadian government. You've been charged with Kate's abduction. <laughs> How much cooperation do you think once they'll get once they cross the border? I'll stay. I, I won't cause any problems, I promise. We will not leave without you, girl. Only if you pay me for her. That's obscene. <laughs> you did it before. I will never forgive myself for that. Just forget about me. Aoife goes to her and holds her in her arms. I could never forget about you. You have to. Kate heads for the door. Baptista stops her. Oh, uh, Kate, this is all my fault. There's nothing we can do now. No, I should have given you the dowry money. You've had too much sun, old man. Please don't talk to him that way. What? Nothing. I'm sorry, master. Don't call him that. I have to. You tell him. You disgust me. Just give me the money. Aoife reaches into her bag. Here it is, $10,000. Thank you kindly. Let's go. After you've given me the rest. What do you mean? Well, the Griffins will need a replacement. That's going to cost me. Well, that's all you're getting. Come, Kate. Kate doesn't move. We only have enough to get back home. Well, she stays here until you come up with the other 10000 Preposterous. We won't do it. Sure. Go ahead and take her. I'll have you arrested for theft. And maybe I'll get a new prospect while I'm at it. You've still got a few years left. You've still got a few wor years work left in you, Baptista. What? I could get a few dollars for him. You want to enslave my husband? It's just business. He grabs Aoife and holds on to her. Kate, go ahead and tie up your father. Kate picks up the rope and goes over to her father and ties his hands behind him. Kate! I told you to go. Baptista! It's all right, Aoife. And bring your mother's purse over here. Let's see if, see if she was holding out on us. Kate picks up the purse that her mother had dropped. Show me. Kate holds up the purse to Peter's face, then sprays perfume in his eyes. 
He lets go of Ethra and screams in pain, staggering around, unable to see. Ah, my eyes! Kate, you shrew! Kate takes the steering paddle and hits him in the head. He falls. Well done, my girl. He gets up. Kate is focused on Peter, who is writhing around on the floor. Go to mother. Baptista goes to Aoife, and they embrace. How did you get free? Kate didn't really tie me up. I thought that we had lost you, Kate. You did for a while, but I'm back. How do we get back to Toronto without him chasing after us? We're taking him with us. What? How? The first thing we have to do is bound and gag my husband. Yeah, let me. Baptista ties Peter up. Let go of me. Kate taps the paddle lightly on his head. Peter, I've still got a good grip on this paddle. Do you want me to hit you in the head again? No. Then I suggest you keep quiet. Father, you can hold the paddle while I'm gone. Where are you going? To find Naomi. What are we going to do? There's no time. Do you trust me? Yes, we trust you. You're making a big mistake. She taps him with a paddle. He submits immediately. Kate hands the paddle to Baptista. She nods to him. He kisses her. Kate leaves. Baptista looks at Peter lying at his feet. We should just kill him. No! Baptista raises the paddle, ready to give Peter a final blow. Scene 9. Bianca's bedroom. Both women sit on the bed, sewing lace onto Bianca's wedding dress. Bianca puts down her section and starts flexing her fingers. Kate keeps going. Bianca watches her. You're doing it again. I'm just so glad that you're back. Me too. When I think of all that you went through. I have some tea. Oh, you always change the subject. It will make you feel better. Only if you have some with me. Right. She stops sewing while Bianca pours into two cups. I'm cold. No matter. They sit away from the dress and take sips from their cups. We can postpone the wedding. I think that you and Luke have waited long enough. I couldn't get married without you. Thank you. I'm more excited for it than I was for my wedding. It's good that you had to wait. Everything happened so quickly for me. It was all part of this plan to keep you off guard. Well, he got what he deserved. We don't have to talk about it. What did mother and father tell you? Well, mother can't bear to talk about it, and father said that it's best that we keep it in the past. Oh. He also said that you're the bravest person he knows. He said that? Yes. He loves you, Kate. He always has. He's better at showing it now. They drink. I can tell you what happened. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> Every few weeks, he would check to see that I was still behaving myself. He would have our marriage license to show me that he could use it to have me committed. Yeah, I know that part, but what happened after you hit him on the head? I left to find Naomi to help me find the right herbs. Father told me that he was going to hit him in the head again. He was, but mother stopped him, thank goodness. I wouldn't have blamed him one bit. It would have ruined my plan. Right. So I found the marriage license in his pocket and gave it to mother. Naomi mixed up a draft that kept him docile for the trip. Whenever we were just stopped, mother told the marshal or whomever that she was traveling with her son-in-law. Which she was. Who had fallen ill while on business in the United States. She was traveling with her slave. Father, and who were you supposed to be? A healer. Weren't you afraid that the people who, that the people that you were living with. The people who owned me. 
he asked. Weren't you afraid that they were going to come after you? Well, the timing couldn't have been better. The mistress had gone into labor. The mister started drinking whiskey and just kept going. Naomi added a sleeping drop to the drinking water for good measure. Everyone on the property just fell asleep. But then didn't she get into trouble? She drank some too. So everyone thinks that I'm the culprit. That's amazing. We crossed into Canada and drove to turn people. All right, I know the rest. I might as well go now. Okay, don't. I have to get it over with. Father is right. You are brave. Or first. No, oh, Kate. We won't talk about this anymore. I'll be back to help you finish. All right, Kate. They embrace. Kate leaves. Bianca picks up her sewing and sniffles as she works. Scene 10, prison cell. Peter is sitting on a bench. I today. My sister is getting married tomorrow. Give her my best. No. Does she know that you're here? She's the only one. Oh. But they all know that you keep writing to me. Well, thanks again for coming. What? To say I'm sorry. Well, that's all right. She then. gets up to leave. I don't blame you for not believing me, hating me. I'm not looking for your approval. I know. I've been working on this for five weeks. Just let me have my say. Go ahead then. I won't come again. Kate sits. I was born on a plantation. We had slaves. I didn't think anything of it. Our crops failed two years in a row. We moved to Illinois. I was eight. My father started working at a hotel. He was side by side with bellhops and chambermaids. He was equal with black people and it ate away at him. He'd come home so angry. I saw it eat away at him. The one thing that gave him any comfort was that he knew he was inherently better because he was white. Like father, like son. I don't feel that way anymore. Only because you got caught. The man who I pretended to be when I met your father is who I am now. You don't believe me. You weren't pretending when you beat me when you threatened to cut out my tongue. That was the real you. That's how it started, but loneliness and isolation can really be instructive. They can be that. Why don't you speak on my behalf? I can change. I can help rescue some of the people I sold. No one would suspect me. I can get in and out of there. Intriguing. I can bring that Indian girl. Naomi? I, I didn't know her name. She's already here. What? Through a secret net network. She and I are opening an apothecary together. Might even have a tea room. Well, congratulations. Thank you. And your father staked you the startup money? There was no need. I have my own money. Really? When I got divorced. Divorced? It was the first thing I did when I got back. I didn't need your signature on the papers since you were a criminal. Wait. Actually, it was the second thing that I did. The first, while I was still your wife, was to cash in all your assets. You didn't. You black bitch. There's the Peter I grew to know. Oh, I wish that you killed me with that paddle. I know. Kate leaves. He rattles the bars on the cage. Naomi enters. Hey, let me out. Sure thing. She opens the cell door. Lighting change. Epilogue.
Toronto, Emancipation Day, 2034. Guide is in the same position as Naomi was in with Christopher Sly. They are in the sitting room. Was all of that true? The writer did take a few liberties. Thought so. All of the names were changed. There was some inspiration from Taming of the Shrew. Right, but he didn't own a hotel and stable. Yes, a black man did own a hotel near where St. Lawrence Market is now, as well as a livery stable. Plus, he and his brother opened up travel between Kingston and Toronto. There was another black man who started Toronto's first cab company. Well, which of them had to rescue his daughter? Well, that part wasn't true. She lived the rest of her life as a slave? No. The man who this was based on had a daughter who married a respectable black man and, from what we understand, led a perfectly ordinary life. Whoa. So that plot twist was in the play to uh, create drama? Well, the story already existed long before we got here. It was a hoax. Why? Why would someone make up something like that? Why do you think someone would want to cast a shadow on this very successful man? Racism? <laughs> Good job. Whoa. That brings us to the end of your experience. We hope that you enjoyed this performance and the Emancipation Day 200th anniversary tour. If you can have your pictures taken in your costume, please exit through the gift shop. Okay. And sorry I was such a goof earlier. No apologies necessary. Mr. Sly, have a good day. Sly exits. Guide puts the velvet ropes back in place and then takes out her walkie-talkie. Christopher Sly has left the building. Thanks. The show seemed to sober him up. Glad to hear it. You can take off. Over. Will do. Over. Guide takes off her bonnet and exits. Baptista enters, wearing something he hasn't worn before. His facial hair is different. He notices the velvet ropes and starts to examine them. He notices the velvet ropes and starts to examine them. What in the world? Kate enters. Are you all right? Yeah, I need to see something familiar. I always loved this room. Hmm. You have any idea what these are? Hmm. Are they meant to keep people out? <laughs> Nonsense. One can just step over it. He indeed steps over a section of velvet rope into the sitting room. They rely on the politeness of Canadians, I suppose. Care to join me? I would love to. She holds out her hand for him as she steps over. They sit. It feels... What? Odd. Yes. The buildings are so tall. They make the market look so small. Mm. It was good to have one recognizable site. Do you know today's date? The big bright sign said August 1st, 2034. We've completely missed the 1900s. 200 years since emancipation. I wonder why we're here. Me too. I think that you're supposed to see what you started. But no one knows who I am. They think that you don't, but they do. I want them to know that you married a perfectly respectable black man and led a relatively unremarkable life. Unremarkable? There are no kidnapping or slavery. Oh, that. Your life was pretty remarkable just as my daughter. I suppose it was. Let's go walk around along the lake. Around. Let's be impulsive. Father. I think we can get away with it. 
I hope so. They exit the room. The end. And that was Kate and Bianca by Marcia Johnson, who is right here with us. Hi, Marcia. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing great. That was so good to hear it. Yeah, it was a really nice play. We had some really great players. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs> and thanks to Glenda and Chantal, who did comments during the reading. That was so great to see that you were there. Yeah, so I just have a few questions for you, Marcia, and we'll pop in some of the other ones as well. Um, so my first question is, well, and I think it's, uh, where is it? Jennifer's as well. Um, what gave you the idea to write this version of the Canadian, of the the Taming of the Shrew? Uh, how did this all start for you? Well, um, Taming of the Shrew has always bothered me, especially when it was written by someone who wrote other great female characters. And like the end of that play, uh, it just uh, makes me crazy. And I just wanted to give it another chance where the father does come to see the value and worth of his daughter because she was a person ahead of her time. And I interviewed a, a friend of mine, Philippa Shepard, who's an English professor at U of T. And she said that her theory is that Taming of the Shrew was written because so many men were feeling emasculated by there being a female monarch. And, um, and there were even flyers being handed out saying, you know, this is how you get to wear the pants in your family. And she feels that Shrew was written to say, so this is what you want? You want a woman to be completely passive and have no spirit and uh, it was, she meant it more like a cautionary tale. Probably that's why the Christopher Sly character having it be a dream and all that. Yeah, but my, my like, so I was thinking of Taming of the Shoe and then I was heard about the story about James Mink and his daughter. And I thought, well, if I give the daughter a little sister, I could mash it up. Well, tell us a little bit about that story. Well, James Mink, um, was a city councilor. He ran a livery stable. He owned a hotel near where St. Lawrence Market is today. Um, he started a coach travel service with his brother between Kingston and Toronto, and he was a millionaire. Um, his father was a freed slave, and when his that family died, the family that owned him, all the money went to him um, and his, his brother. They might have had a few more siblings. And he was a very respectable man. He did really well for himself. His mother, his wife was uh, Irish um, by birth. And uh, I, I don't know of any other children. I just know of their daughter, Mary. Awesome. Uh, so I was wondering about the framing device. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, where does that sit for you? What, what was the intention behind it? Well, the thing is, I heard about James Mink about 30 years ago. Sandy Ross told me about him. But I heard about him through the story of the kidnapped daughter sold into slavery. Mm. So that story was the big story. And then I got a commission to write this play when I was talking to an artistic director about him and told him all the pieces that I wanted to fit in. And then two days after getting the commission during my regular research, I found this piece that had been written a few years ago, debunking the story of the kidnapping. It was a myth. It was created by a pro-slavery advocate who just mm. wanted to humiliate black people, wanted to show that they would fail when they had their own money and were up to their own devices. And it sure worked because whenever I thought of James Mink, I only thought of that. And uh, so that was really heartbreaking. I mean, I'm glad that it didn't happen, but for my story, I didn't want to perpetuate that hoax, that myth. I wanted to show him to be a successful man and his daughter to be a successful woman. And so that's what I'm playing with now. And uh, that's where the framing device is in. And uh, it's, it's like I half-heartedly wrote the play the best that I could with trying to still have the suspense with it not being a true story. Um, it just gets talked about at the end. So there's a lot of work to do. I'm just not sure how to do that yet while showing respect for the real people 
and still having a good drama. It is a good drama, but I, I understand those first drafts are so much about like figuring out who these characters are and how they yeah. fit with yeah. our real world and how we do a play, right? Yeah, it's true. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so talk to me a little bit about this uh, indigenous character, Naomi. Where did that sort of start for you? Um, well, uh, there's a really wonderful nonfiction book written by Robin Maynard called uh, Policing Black Lives. And I've read it a few times because I did the audiobook version of it. I, if you get it, that's my voice. And I learned so much. I, uh, and one of the things I learned that there were indigenous people who were enslaved. And in my writing, I always like to not only tell the story of marginalized people that I come from, but to reach out to other people who don't have as much representation. So that was a double whammy. It was show an indigenous person, the people who were originally here, and then also showed that there was a level of suffering that we didn't know about, like yet another one. Um, so she is underdeveloped for now, but I, I hadn't really done a lot of research by the time I wrote this, but I, I'm looking forward to diving into that and to find a few people that I can base her on. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, so what's the next step for you with this play? Well, the theater hasn't read it yet. And here I am um, have, <laughs> doing this. Um, the, the supposed final draft is due in September, but what with everything going on, um, you know, I'm sure that's going to be stretched and uh, haven't had a chance to meet with the artistic director. He's got other things on his mind. Mm -hmm. um, but now that I've heard it, there are just some things about it that I think are salvageable. It is not the complete write-off that I thought that it was. Uh, thank you to the cast for that. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so I'll just sit on that. And um, once I hear what the AD thinks, we can move on from there and I'll just write something else while I'm waiting. <laughs> we have another question. Yeah. Uh, so was Naomi Canadian or American? Um, well, they were in Kentucky. <clears throat> so uh, she would have been, and I was using the word Canadian too much, I believe now, cause yeah. you know, Canada's 1867 and this was 1854. Um, yeah, so. I'm open to whatever she would be, but um, she would uh, likely be from somewhere in the South. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. she could have been brought over. She could have been brought over and just doesn't remember her family. <clears throat> so I'm just going to open it up to the actors, see if they have any questions. And while we're throwing it open to the actors, for questions. Um, if anyone else from the audience has questions, you can post them in the comments below. Um, so do you guys have any questions for Marcia? Mm. Comments, <laughs> questions, concerns? Um, maybe just like thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much language. I just think about uh, language that we have to say and experience as actors uh, and like having to say master, like those sort of triggering um, complicated racial titles that um, elicit drama, right? Like you, it's, it's from a time, it's language from a time and it, it, it does elicit that discomfort that you wanna lean into to educate. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of me wonder too, because it's sort of a play within a play, what that might look like in a, in a room or even in a, a script to be able to embrace the sort of shudder of the forcing someone to say master. Yeah. Because it is already that play within a play set up from the beginning. I wonder what it would be if it with an additional layer of the re revelation of what it takes for the actor to go through uh -huh. that or physical violence as well. Yeah. 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 I'm very aware of that as an actor myself too. Like I just put myself into those shoes and um, there is a, a lot of, um, I do take quite a bit of care. Um, that's why Kate gets to stand up and she's about to take the slap. She will take it. Right. And um, uh, she has that dignity and that self-worth. So the fact that a few scenes later, she does agree to do that, you see just how low she has become. Um, 
that those are really good points. And I do, I'm very conscious. I don't use things lightly that way. And there are things that I avoid. Hopefully they don't look like they're missing, but. Um, I don't think they do. Yeah. And everyone embraces the, the disgusting reality of some people's beliefs, right? It's important yeah. to talk about. Yeah, and I have to tell you something. Um, I did not remember, this happens to me sometimes. I did not remember writing that um, thing of, um, of um, Peter's about the father moving to Illinois and having to work side by side. I have no memory of writing that. It's, <laughs> it's so bizarre. Um, and I'm trying to think of where it came from, but that's why you never throw away drafts. You just never know what's gonna stay there and what's gonna work. It's that's so funny. <laughs> but it's interesting the psychology, right? You provide yeah. The yeah. Okay, why do people believe awful things about other humans? And there's there's yeah, and that's just it. If I put myself there, because it's just a, a waste of an audience's intelligence or an a actor's intelligence to write someone who's just this mustache twirling evil person. You gotta think, where did it come from? And I have to put myself in those people's skin, you know, and I just have to put that in. So I think that just came out of me and I said, yes, and you just stay there on the paper. I don't need you right now. <laughs> Can I also ask what the father was wearing? It doesn't say in the script specifically that he's wearing. Oh, yeah, he was dressed like he, he dressed as, he's a gentleman. He's an upper class gentleman and he was dressed as a slave. Yeah. However, the designer would do that. <laughs> Marcia, Ooh, um, is there a specific that you think? Oh, sorry, that broke up a little bit. Sorry, is there a specific person that you based Peter off of? Petruchio mm -hmm. from Taming of the Shrew, as well as just any human being who would sell and trade human beings. Like, you know, it's a bit of a mashup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, but I don't, yeah, no, no, like individual person. Yeah. Ray, Catherine, any thoughts? I know I I I love it. I love it. <laughs> I loved being part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very that, has that name, so I know the name very well. Oh, you do. Great. Yeah. He's Irish. Yes. <laughs> very Irish name. Yeah. Thank you, Chantel. <laughs> Ray, you were saying something? Uh, no, it's just very impactful. I'm not. I'm not a very uh, a smart actor where I have a lot of things to say afterwards. Uh, taking it in for the first time, hearing it was like holy. You know, you, you, you don't hear it off the page until it's actually heard. So um, it's a very exciting play and a very deep play. Thank you. So, well, as I said uh, to Hannah, I don't usually go for like readings or anything kind of public at this early stage, but these pandemic times are, mm -hmm. are making me just uh, stretch out and try new things. And I am really glad that I went for it because you, you've you showed just mm -hmm. hearing you and it really did a lot for me. So thank you. Well, thanks for putting it out there. And, and mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to sound cliche, but obviously it's timely. Yeah. yeah. These are subjects we have to look at. So, yeah. so thanks for, for putting it out there. Marcia, yeah, I appreciate thank it. Thank you, Marcia. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for Marcia for uh, for sharing this play with us. It was, it came at kind of an ironic time. It was a little bit disappointing that we had to cancel last week, but um, we needed to. Yeah, it's true. Um, one of the things we did last week is I, I took it to the cast and to Marcia to make that decision, um, just because it's this is not a journey that I'm embarking on on my own. Um, so. Is there anything else that you guys wanted to talk about before we close off the show? Awesome. Um, now, before you all go, I just want to let you guys know that off the top, I meant to dedicate this show to Regis Korczynski Packett, who was the Toronto woman who was also multiracial, who died in an altercation with the police um, when she was 
she was having a seizure and they called the police and and that's the the unfortunate story that we're hearing a lot these days um i know for me because i have epilepsy that story really impacted me and has like given me a chance to reflect on my privilege as a white disabled person and um but yes i just want to dedicate this reading to her and her memory and all the other people that we've lost recently and it was very close to where i live yeah true yeah yes. i have epilepsy too so mm. that touched me as well yeah yeah. Um, well, Marcia, were you going to say something? No, I was just saying she lives right. She lived right close to me. Yeah. 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 That's insane. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you to our readers, and uh, stay strong in the struggle, everyone. Stay strong. Thank you so much. All the best to you. Stay healthy and safe and distant, just for a little while longer. Yes.